This is a reading of Co-Talker, chapter 23, and, and its title is Povavu. Happy New Year, Jarhead, Smitty said before he poured part of his bottle of beer over my head. I had to laugh. He and several of our other signal core guys had put on grass skirts and were swaying their hips to imitate the hula dancers we'd been entertained by on Hawaii, which now thousands of miles away from us poor lonely Marines. My shoulder was still too stiff for me to lift my arm high enough to return the favor to Smitty. So I covered the mouth of my own bottle of beers with my thumb and shook it. Happy 1945, I yelled as I squirted foam back at him. 1945, I could hardly believe it. On the one hand, it seemed to me as if we were a few days ago when I was standing in the recruiting office convincing the Marines that I was old enough to join up. But on the other hand, remembering the battles I'd been through and the many men I'd seen killed or wounded, it seemed as if those days when I was just a Navajo boy going to school and helping his family with the sheep were long, long ago. I wished so much that this war would be over and I could go back to being just a Navajo sheep herder again. <clears throat> Along with a lot of other Marines, including a bunch of us co-talkers, I was now on a tiny Pacific island called P Pavavu, and it was as hot as Bougainville, and the bugs were even worse. Not only did a lot of Marines get malaria, there was also this disease carried by insects that made your arms and legs swell up. All we could do was spray DDT everywhere, Yes, grandchildren, I know that DDT is a very bad poison, but back then it was all we had to use. We used so much of it that there was a joke I started making. Hey, I'd say to the cook in the, me in the mess hall, my food didn't taste good to so good today. Next time we'll put more DDT in it. The DDT did not stop the rats. They were everywhere on Povavo big black and brown rats. After dark, the ground rippled with them. If you set foot outside your door at night, there was a good chance you would step on one of them. My old friends, the giant land crabs were there too, just as many of them as there were rats. They were on the ground, climbing up the coconut trees, scratching on the sides of our tents. They never seemed to bother each other, those rats and land crabs but they sure as shooting bothered me. As soon as it started to get dark on Pavavu, I went inside and stayed there. But during the day, we were kept pretty busy on Pavavu. How about Biaato? That means underwater. Child, that's frog. That would be good for amphibious. As always, we co-talkers had to add to our vocabulary. Some of the new terms we were creating had to do with secret underwater demolition teams. Men trained to swim beneath the surface of the water with air tanks on their backs and rubber flippers on their feet. They looked so much like underwater monsters that it made me uncomfortable to look at them in their gear. Frogmen. Those frogmen went quietly at night in small rubber boats into enemy territory. They did such dangerous things as laying charges on the hulls of enemy ships or placing explosive to clear paths through reefs. <clears throat> we code talkers knew better than anyone what those brave frogmen did, not just because we had to send messages about them. Whenever frogmen teams went in ahead of an invasion, one or two Navajos with radios were with them in their rubber boats but you can bet that none of us code talkers ever went underwater with them. Because our code was used for top secret messages, I knew about a lot of things. I even had heard mention of new giant bombs being prepared, but I told no one. Our code was only one of the many secrets I kept. That was just the way it had to be during wartime. In fact, every serviceman in the Pacific knew secrets 
that had to be kept from his civilian friends and relatives back in the States. That's why every GI letter home was read by censors who often blacked out big sections. The suicide planes that the Japanese were now sending against us were among those secrets kept from those at home. Japanese pilots were no longer just dropping bombs and shraffing. Now they were coming in waves of small planes called kamikazes. Loaded with high explosives, their aim was to dive right into the target, especially big targets like our battleships and air carriers. Before February 1945, the ordinary American people didn't know about kamikazes. Our commanders wanted to maintain morale back home and didn't want to frighten the civilians. It was like not showing pictures of dead American soldiers. For the whole first year America in the war, there were no photographs of dead American soldiers in any newspapers, not even one until 1943. It troubled me deeply to think of enemies so determined to kill us that they would give up their own lives. Whenever a Japanese pilot volunteered to become a kamikaze pilot, he was given a funeral service before he got into his plane. The Japanese government made it sound as if these men would be great heroes, their deeds would save Japan. As I've said before, I've always loved reading history. All through the war, I did research in ship libraries and borrowed books from Marine officers who were history buffs and who liked the idea of an Indian being a historian. I kept on doing that kind of research after the war too. So over the years, I was able to learn where the idea of kamikaze came from. Here's the history. 700 years ago, Kublai Khan was the ruler of China. He decided that he and his Mongols should invade Japan. He put together a huge fleet and set it off to Japan. But before he got there, a great typhoon roared out of the Pacific and sank every ship. Seven years later, Kublai Khan sent a second huge fleet. And just like the first, it was destroyed by that giant wind that the Japanese began to call kamikaze. Kamikaze, the holy wind. They believed that the holy wind would always defend Japan. The pilots flew the suicide missions, though they were flying as the pilots who flew the suicide missions thought they were flying with that holy wind. A Japanese rear admiral, Masafumi Arima, was the first kamikaze pilot. On October of 1944, he tried to crash his plane into the aircraft carrier Franklin. A Navy fighter shot him down into the sea before he was even close. However, the Japanese propaganda machine made him into a martyr. martyr. They said that he sank a giant American ship. Thousands of people volunteered to be kamikaze pilots. Sometimes those planes were so old they could barely take off. Most of them missed. In the Philippines, only one out of every four kamikazes actually struck a target. No big ships were ever sunk by one. However, in Japan, all the newspapers made it sound as if their kamikaze missions were great successes. Soon they said the American fleet would be totally destroyed. What the Japanese newspaper said was far from the truth. Slowly but surely, the tide had turned. The tide had been turned as the first days of the new year of 1945 turned into weeks and we sat there waiting on Pavavu. We began to believe that we were close to the end. The Japanese were continuing to retreat. Our planes were now bombing the enemy's homeland. It was clear that Japan was going to be defeated. Chief, my friend Smitty said as he read the Stars and Stripes, the Arms Forces newspaper given to servicemen. MacArthur has been kicking butt since he landed at Leighton. Sounds like we're gonna be celebrating the 4th of July in Tokyo this year. Y'all thinking that's something, Georgia boy said, holding up the copy of his own paper. My work in teaching him to read finally paid off a few months earlier.
Not hardly a day went by without him wanting to read something aloud to us. Listen to this here. Ma, New York Yankees have been sold to a syndicate for $2,800,000. That's there about enough to buy the whole state of Georgia. I nodded to my friends. Each in his own way was excited about the prospect of the war's ending. But from what I, I now knew about the Japanese, I was very worried. When did they decide it was helpless? What would they do?